Is it, are your books? <laughs> Not just any book. Open the living word of God. <laughs> Open your Bibles to uh, Titus chapter 2. Um, I don't want this in my hand. I need some water. Titus chapter 2. How many have read Titus lately? Anybody read Titus lately? How many know that Titus is a book in the Bible? Titus is a great book in the Bible. If you've never read Titus, I encourage you to do so. We're going to go through some scriptures of it here today uh, as we look at God's grace. Oh, man, I've been so blessed looking, reading, studying, receiving the grace of God and what he's been showing me throughout the scripture of who he is. Let's define grace, first of all. There's a lot of people who talk about grace in different ways. My goal is to just talk about it biblically. That's my goal all the time. But there's a lot of opinions about grace out there. And there's a lot of what we call like cheapening it to an extent. But here's the beauty of grace. I don't believe you can cheapen it. Because Jesus is grace. I can't make Jesus cheaper. He is who he is. And I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to touch that. And I don't believe, and I already said this, that grace is a license to do anything opposed to the will of God. Okay? But we got to get a revelation of grace and how we can receive from him. Because we're not very good as Christians at receiving things. But yet, if you read Galatians chapter 3, chapter 4, it says that we receive, we inherit the promises. It says three or four times that we are to receive the things of the kingdom. But right now, if I were to give you 20 bucks, I don't have it on me, I'd give it to you. Some of you would have a hard time taking that from me for a couple of different reasons. Oh, I don't need it. That's okay. Give it to somebody else. Well, nobody want to bless you with it. Well, that's okay. Give it to somebody else who needs it. It's not about need. I want to bless you with it. You have to receive it. Does that make sense? But we don't do that well. Well, whether for pride or for embarrassment, whatever it may be, we have a hard time receiving. But the only way to be a Christian is to receive the finished work of the cross and what he has done. That's it. You can't earn it. There's all kinds of religions out there that have do's and don'ts and lists that you can do to find your great, holy, inner peace, sanctum, whatever that may be, right? Not Christianity. Christianity was done for us. Salvation, that is. But that's what we're talking about, grace. Grace is this. It is an unearnable gift. It is unwarranted kindness. Some of you are mean. I've been mean. Okay, here's a story of my meanness back in my other days. I was very awkward. I've told you this many times, socially awkward. And I always was going out with somebody in high school. Okay, I use that term because we didn't go anywhere for a long time. We just saw each other at school and then went home, right? But that's the term they use. When I wanted to break up with a person, I just ignored them and didn't talk to them anymore. <laughs> that's mean. That's just what I'm saying. And finally, I was in eighth grade. I remember this. And God bless her. She is the sweetest girl. And I, I want to ask her to forgive me. So if she ever get a hold of this, you know, Kendall, you can share on Facebook. I don't know if you're friends with her or not. But I had a girlfriend at the time. And, and I stopped talking to her for like two weeks. There's only like 75 people in my class, okay? So it's not like we don't know each other. It's not like a class of 900, right, or even Martinsville, whatever that is. It was a small class, 75. We all knew each other in the grades above and below. I didn't talk to her for two weeks, so finally she came over to me at lunch and says, do you want to break up with me or something? Because she haven't talked to me in like two weeks. I said, that sounds good. Okay. <laughs> That's so pathetic, but it was mean. So what I'm saying is we all can be mean. It's not in God's nature. He's, he said he's the God of all grace. It means he gives us unwarranted kindness. We don't deserve his kindness. We don't deserve the gifts that he has given. And that's hard for some of us because we have quite a value uh, and opinion of ourselves. And so um, that's okay. The Lord will deal with you on that as we continue to go through this. We cannot earn, we cannot be good enough to get what God wants to do or freely give to us. The gift or the benefit is this again, this is all grace, defining grace, is the effect, the gift that he's giving is the effect of his graciousness. Graciousness is a part of his character. It says in Luke 4.22 that Jesus spoke and his words were gracious. Now what will happen if you start to have gracious words? More people will want to hear you speak. Women came to Jesus. Children came to Jesus. 
Pharisees who opposed him came to him still to hear him speak. Sinners came to him. His disciples came to him. His words were gracious all the time and all the time truth as well. That's the way we are to be. You feel like nobody's listening to you in your life? How are your words? It says, let every word come out, you know, be grace to the hearer. Seasoned with salt. That's the truth part. But they need to be grace to the hearer. You're not going to deserve what I'm about ready to speak to you, in other words. In other words, you're being a real jerk right now, but I love you, and so does Jesus, and he has a better way for your life. That's grace. I still told them they were being a jerk, though. <laughs> That's truth. Amen? But it's the way we do it. It's a heart of humility. But it's out of God's graciousness, his character, that grace flows to us. Does this make sense? All right, stay with me here. Grace bestows delight and favor and pleasure upon somebody. Have you ever just gotten something at work? You know, all of a sudden, you know, you, you, you got noticed by the boss, even though you thought nobody was noticing what was going on. That's favor. That's kindness. That's grace to you. It's just bestowed upon you. You may not have even deserved it. This is grace. This is, this is God's grace to us. Graciousness is given freely. It's spontaneously like a redemptive mercy in contrast to debt. And the one receiving grace experiences that grace. Okay, so when Ken and I were first married, we didn't have much money. I was a brand new teacher. I made, let's see, what, $31,000 a year, right? First brand new teacher, right? I didn't make a lot of money. Um, and that's okay. I don't, I'm not, my life's not driven by money. And so, but we didn't have much when we got married. That we were okay with that. We had enough. We never lacked. But all of a sudden, Pastor Adam, out of nowhere, graciously gives us like a $2,000 bedroom suit. We were, we were just married. We've been married 20 years come in July. Guess what? We still have that bedroom suit, by the way. But that's grace. I didn't do anything to deserve that. I barely knew the guy. I mean, he knew Kendall. And if you know Kendall, you, you know, you just, she's just so wonderful. You just love to do things for her, right? When we got married um, and we bought our first house, we bought it from um, Kim and Danny Pearson. Danny, God bless him, I called him dad back then. He offered at any point, any time to come over to my house and do anything because it was his house. I said, you don't, you don't owe me that. We bought this from you. It didn't matter. That's favor. That's kindness. I didn't warrant that. I didn't do anything to deserve that. He just, out of his gracious character, wanted to give that. Amen? And this is the way that God, this is the way that he looks upon us. He, because he's gracious, determines to bestow his grace upon us, his people. He didn't ask you and me. He just did it because he wanted to. So what is his grace? What has he given to us? What is his favor towards you and I? Titus chapter 2, Titus verse 11, 2, 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God's grace has shown up to all men. Well, who, sh who showed up? Who was manifest? Jesus. If you turn back a page or so in your Bible to uh, 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, it says it like this. Well, let's look at verse 8. It says, Do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord or of me, Paul, his prisoner. Be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who, God, has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. We are called because he was gracious enough to call us, not by any works that we have done. Which was given to us in whom? His grace is given to us in Christ Jesus. Before the world began. But is now shown, made manifest by the appearing of our Savior in Jesus Christ. Who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Look, all these things are an act of his grace. Him abolishing death, I can't earn that. Jesus did it for me. God gave it to us. He's brought immortality to light. We have eternal life through Christ Jesus. I can't earn that. Jesus did that. He's offering it to us. We have to choose to receive what he has done. Jesus is the grace of God manifest that has appeared to all men. What are you and I doing with the grace of God? What a slap in the face it is to Jesus. He hung on that cross. Not that one literally. But hung on the cross, he bled and he died a sinner's death, having done no wrong. 
to say, yes, I believe in Jesus, and then go live the same way we did before we said, yes, I believe in Jesus. That is not receiving the grace of God. I don't believe that that person was saved. We can't flippantly say, I believe in Jesus. I'm jumping way ahead in my notes, but I just want to get that across right here. When we say we believe in Jesus, there's one act that must happen. We, you and I, must die. So if before Jesus, I love to party and get drunk and, and do all these things, and then I say I receive Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, and I still love to party and get drunk and do all these things, did I truly receive his finished work on the cross? I would say no. We don't want to cheapen who Jesus is and what he went through in that way. Amen? So I'm not speaking that grace, nor would I ever speak that grace. But I do want to get across to you that some of you are trying to, you're keeping an analog of your do's and don'ts, and you're basing your relationship with the Lord on how you've passed or failed. That is not receiving the grace of God. That is putting yourself under the law, and the law justifies nobody. And that's what the Bible says. We're going to get there. So let's look, look at this a little bit farther. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Is it okay if we go through some scriptures today to establish? It says, but of him are you in Christ. And that of him is God. I am in Christ by God. One of the greatest acts of grace that God has given is he put us, you and I, in Christ Jesus. And then likewise, Christ is in us. What does it say in John chapter 15, verse 4, I believe? Abide in me and I in you. Both of those things are acts of his grace. I only have the ability to abide in him because God has put me there. I must choose to stay there. That's what the word abide means. He's in me. He did that. I can't do that. That's, that's an act that he's done by grace. That we are in Christ is an act of God's favor and kindness and grace. See, you and I were in a horrible sin pit. That's where we were before Jesus. But God gives us a new position. We need a new starting point. And so he places us in Christ Jesus. And by doing so, he has settled our past. Just think of yourself in a giant pit. There's no way out. You can't climb the walls. There's no rope. There's no ladder. And that pit is sin. It's sin that you were born into because Adam chose to sin. And because Eve was deceived. You and I were born in the same pit. And we need a way out of that pit. And we can't do it ourselves. By the grace of God, when we receive Jesus Christ, his grace extended to us. He grabs us out of that pit. He says it like this. I translated you from the kingdom of, dar of darkness into the kingdom of my dear son. He takes you out of that pit. That's in Colossians, by the way. And he puts us in Christ Jesus. And so now all the experience of Christ Jesus has become ours. Does that make sense? I know it's, it's, sometimes it's a hard spiritual concept, but the, the sooner that you can grab a hold of that, the better your life will be because you're going to start to receive his finished work instead of trying to earn it and stop beating yourself up when you miss it. Just get back in him and receive that. This, this Bible, let, let, you know, for example, right here, there's this piece of paper. And this piece of paper, it says it's a someday sermon for Kenny. Somebody gave it to me. It's uh, Brian Zill did. It's awesome. It's about names. But anyway, if I take this paper, my one act for this paper is to put it in my Bible. I'm going to close the Bible. Now let's say I mailed this Bible to London, England. Did I do anything to the paper inside? No. My action was upon the Bible itself. If I leave this Bible here and, and, and go uh, today and I, and I just don't come back and get it, guess what? Did I do anything to the paper? No, I did something to my Bible. I just left it where it was. The same thing is when it says that we are in Christ Jesus. We're the paper inside. So when Christ Jesus died on the cross... You and I died. So many of us are looking for the experience of crucifixion or death to self. We're looking for it as an experience. It's not an experience to be had. It's to be received. I can't experience the death. of. Now, I believe he can make it more known to us. But he's the one who died. And when he died, I died. See, the problem is this. A lot of us, when we get saved, we have this backpack full of things, and we feel like we need to take all those things out and put new things in, right? Because we want to do better with our lives. That's not death. The problem before death wasn't that I did bad things. The problem was I was bad. Does that make sense? Because if I always focus on the bad things that I do, 
That's like trying to take every apple off of a tree. No, the root needs to be cut and the tree needs to die. See the difference? And God, through his grace, did that. He put me in Christ. So when Christ died, I died. I need to receive that. When Christ was raised from the dead, I have new life in him. I need to receive that. When Christ was seated on high at the right hand of God the Father, like Ephesians 2 says, I was seated on high in the spirit. I need to receive that. It's not some experience I gain. It's something I need to receive. See, some of us, our receivers are off. We want to always be the giver. And the Bible says that in the natural. It says, if you have gifts to give, you need... In fact, I just read this in Leviticus. It's great. It always comes out. The Bible is all connected, right? It said this. If, so, if, you're, if somebody comes to you, and if it's your brother and he is completely poor and has no more money, you are required to take him in and give him place in your home. And you are required not to charge him for it. That was the Levitical law. You're required to do that. How many of us today, we have no money, we're poor, we're struggling, and we, we struggle to ask anybody for any help in any way, shape, or form? But yet the Bible says to us as Christians, if you have means to help somebody, we are required, this is New Testament now, to give and support and help in that person in need. The only way I can't give and help in that person in need is when I don't know about it. Why are we not sharing? Because we have a hard time receiving. This isn't just a block in the natural. I'm telling you, it's a block in the spiritual. Some of us have walked with Christian, as a Christian for a very long time. There's still things the Lord has freely given that you have not yet received because of your own stubbornness, because of pride, because you're embarrassed that, oh, God, I have to go back to that place. It's not a place. We go from glory to glory to glory. We're not climbing the corporate ladder. God has freely given it. I'm way off my nose. I mean, we're not even going to get through the first chapter. It's okay. But do we understand that we have to receive what Christ has already done? We are the paper in the book. His experiences has settled my past. Everything that, let's look at some of those things that we've done. Now I lost my place in my Bible. Romans chapter 3, verse 9 and 18. Let's read how great we were in our past. You know that's a setup, right? Okay. Oh, let's take a look at this. What then, verse 9, are we better than they? Now, this is the comparison between the Gentiles and the Jews that Paul is painting, right? He's saying, are we better than the Jews? No, we are not better than the Jews. For we have already proven that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. We're born into it. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That includes you and I. Before Christ. Amen. There is none who understands. There is none that even seek after God. Wow. You're like, well, how did I get saved in? Because he says that he draws you to him. You didn't come to God. He drew you to him. And then you had a choice to receive him or not. Does that make sense? You're like, yeah, but all of a sudden I heard a song and I want to know more about God. Yeah, because he drew you and you acted upon that. That's his grace extended to you. It says in Ephesians, by grace you've been saved through faith. He's extended his grace by faith I have to receive what he extends. That's my part. If I don't, I'm denying the grace of God. Jesus extended to me. But he said, how else can we come to him unless he draws a man? Right, that's scripture. He says right here, no one he seeks God before they have Jesus. No one is seeking him. This is who we were. This is this pit that we were in. It says, their throat is an open sepulcher. Well, that sounds nice. And with their tongues, they've used deceit. They have the poison of asps under their lips. Man, we were awesome. It means everything we spoke was horrible. It was not full of faith. It had no faith. And it cursed. It blessed not. This is who we were. It was bitterness. Whose mouth is full of cursing. Oh, there it is. And bitterness. Their feet were swift to shed blood. This is Jews and Gentiles. He's saying, he's saying no difference between either one. Destruction and misery were their ways. And the way of peace they did not know. And there was no fear of God before their eyes. When I say you were in a horrible sin pit and I were in a horrible sin pit, this is the pit that we were in. This describes every one of our lives. You say, no, I was a good person. I grew up in church. That's irrelevant. You can go to church your whole life and never get saved. You can go to church your whole life and never know Jesus Christ as Lord. 
and Savior. That's just a fact. Jesus said, depart from me, for I never knew you. He says, who inherited the kingdom? Two people, those who obeyed him and the ones that he knew. Because the beginning of that scripture there, Matthew says, those who obey me have done my will. Then he goes, and then they try to make an excuse. Well, we've done things for you, Lord. He goes, but depart from me, I never knew you. See, doing his will and obedience should come out of knowing him first. Because we were created for good works to do. Not for salvation. That is grace. It says, you and, I, you and I belong to Adam, and we only had Adam, this is Adam in the garden, as our nature. Not only was our behavior bad, but I was bad, therefore I must die. It says in Romans 6, 7, it says that he that is dead is freed from sin. You have to be dead. It says reckon that you're dead. What does that mean? It means it's already written down in God's holy logbook. I have to look at it and go, oh yeah, I'm dead, I forgot, I don't want to do that. We just have to remind ourselves, renew our mind daily that we are dead to ourselves. Our old man has died. Galatians 2.20 expounds upon it greatly. It says, now the the life I live, it's Christ in me that lives the life. It's not my life. I hope this isn't too basic and it's not too deep. Uh, uh, Either way, I want you to understand that you have to receive the finished work of Jesus Christ in your life. If not, you're going to spend the entirety of it trying to gain what he's already given. And that is a place of frustration. That is a place where the enemy can come and beat you up. Not only do I need to die or receive that I've died in Christ Jesus, I must live again and live for God where he is. Death, resurrection, ascension are all mine now because of his grace in Christ Jesus. To escape the inheritance I have in Adam, what is the inheritance I have in Adam? Sin, which begets death. That's what we're born into. That's what we get for our being born. (laughs) We get a life of sin until we receive Jesus, and ultimately, the wages of sin is death, which is death separated from God eternally. That's what we have to escape from. We have to escape from sin reigning in our life. This is a problem you and I cannot solve on our own. That I am in Christ, 1 Corinthians one thirty, is of God. God solved our problem because God sent Jesus Christ. God sent grace to the world in the man Jesus. That's who we have to receive. You and I who deserve the least, we have been given the most. Turn th- let's, look at, let's continue to look here at Romans chapter 3. God's grace opposes God's law. You're like, wait a minute. But I thought the law of God was good. They both have a purpose. But they oppose each other like oil and water, right? If I have a rusty bicycle chain, I'm not going to put water on it. That's going to exasperate the problem. I'm going to put oil on it, right? It has a purpose. The law has a purpose. God's grace is like oil and water. It doesn't mix with the law. We're going to read that here in a minute. If I'm thirsty, I'm not going to go drink a cup of oil. I'm going to drink a cup of water. It has a different purpose, okay? So here, let's, let's continue reading in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 19. So after Paul just described the horrible sin pit that we were in, now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth be stopped and all the world has become guilty before God. That's what the law did. It made everybody guilty because the law identifies what sin is. So we can't ever say, I didn't know. We know. The law tells us what sin is. What is the law now? What is the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. If I'm doing anything opposed to that, that's his law now. It's sin. Love your neighbor as yourself. If I'm doing anything opposed to that, guess what? That's sin. He says in verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh, no person, be justified. The word justified means made righteous. It's the act of making something righteous. So by doing the law, no person will ever be made right before God. That's verse 20. All these religions that have do's and don'ts is just working by the law to make themselves righteous. The Bible says you cannot gain righteousness 
before God. You cannot be right before God by following a list of laws and rules. The only way for you and I to be made right before God is through Jesus Christ, whom he gave by grace. You have to receive it, though. You're like, I know this. You just keep beating the same point. Yeah, that's okay. Today's a one-point message. You have to receive Jesus Christ, the grace of God, in order, in order to live this life in victory now. It's the only way. Your life's going to be full of toil and struggle and disappointment and frustration when you try to do things in your own strength apart from the grace of God, which he's already freely given unto you. Verse 21, but now the righteousness, was, whenever you see righteousness, that's just the old word for it. You being right before God is what it means. You cannot stand in the presence of Almighty God if you are not right with him. If you do, you would die instantly. Because God is righteous and holy and he's a judge. So as soon as you stand before the judge, your sentence is passed. Does that make sense? So if I'm standing before him in sin, my sentence is past, death is immediate. If I'm standing before him covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who's made me righteous before him, guess what? I go see Jesus. That's, that's it. Those are the only two options. This is why there was a holy fear of God in the Old Testament. Because when he said, well, what did he say when they were at the temple or when they were at the mountain? He says, don't allow anybody to come near this mountain or even your animals because if they do and they touch it, they will die. Why? Because God was inhabiting the mountain, and they were not righteous. They were not holy. They were not pure. He said, don't let them come. He was warning them. Thank God for Jesus' blood. Now we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen? That was better than, than you let on, but that's okay. It says, but now the rightness that we had before God outside of the law is shown being witnessed us being right with God is being shown. It's Jesus in the flesh. Jesus was witnessed of by the law, it's the Old Testament, and the prophets of the Old Testament. That's what the scripture says. In other words, the law in the Old Testament, right? Genesis, Exodus, Levit well, it's not Genesis, but anyway. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy spoke of Jesus. The prophets of the Old Testament spoke of Jesus. They witnessed to it being, him being manifest. That's this word. That's this verse. Verse 22, even being right before God, which is by faith of Jesus, unto all and upon all those that believe. How do we get right with God? The faith of Jesus, faith in who he is. And who did he come to? Who was he shown to? It says all. He was shown to all. So then we have a choice to receive him, to believe on him, or to not. It is always a choice. For all have sinned, we know this verse very well, and come short of the glory of God. Remember, Paul is saying, he's saying Jews and Gentiles are in the same boat. Everybody is sinned. Doesn't matter if you're Jew, doesn't matter if you're Gentile, you're in the same boat. Verse 24, being therefore made righteous, that's justified, freely. It's free to you. It's a gift to you. By his grace, through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, who God set forth to be the price paid through faith in his blood to declare us righteous for the remission of our sins. Hallelujah. The law and grace don't contradict each other, but they are opposed to each other. We're all under sin. The only way that we are justified, the only way that we're made righteous is a free gift of grace through Jesus Christ. This is, this, is, this is one of the seminal aspects of Christianity. You and I right now stand right before God because of the work that Jesus did. You and I are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, it says in 2 Corinthians. You and I need to have an understanding, stop looking at ourselves through sin's eyes. When Peter was in the boat and he hauled in all those fishes, right, after Jesus said, we've done it all night, he said, go ahead and put it on the other side. He hauled in all those fish. When Peter was in the boat with Jesus, he threw himself down after he hauled in the boat because he said, I'm a sinner, depart from me. Why would we tell the one person who could do something about your sin to depart from me? Because Peter was only conscious of his sin nature. Some of us as Christians are still doing that. We're not conscious or aware that we're righteous. We're not conscious or aware that we've received by grace justification, being made righteous. And therefore, we still push Jesus away when he's the answer to all of our problems. He's the answer to what is afflicting you on the inside. Addiction. Jesus is the answer. He's, made, he's freed you from that. But we have to receive that freedom and allow him to walk it out through our lives. 
If I keep putting up some kind of rules of do's and don'ts, it's okay to have guards and fences, but those do's and don'ts will never free me from bondage. It's like AA or NA or any of those. The first thing that they always say is, what do they say? They say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. Calling yourself what you're not because you've been freely justified by Jesus Christ is not going to bring freedom to your life. It's just not. I'm not speaking against those programs. It's helped a lot of people. But ultimately, it's a work of the flesh. And as a work of the flesh, it'll be burned up and it can evaporate at any time. But when we receive by grace, we receive the grace that God has extended to us through Jesus Christ, his shed blood, freedom that is in him, death that is in him, resurrection in him, ascension upon high that is in him. Guess what? Our freedom is eternal. And now we can live and walk that out because he is living and walking it out through our lives. And now for me to sin, I have to do it against my new nature. I have to do it against him because he's the one who is in me. Jesus, it says, the, the, God fulfilled the law with the grace personified in Jesus. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. It says that he was tempted in every way. What are the ways? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. All temptation can be put in one of those three categories. But yet he did not sin. Therefore he fulfilled the law because he did not sin. Okay? Jesus fulfilled the entirety of the law. The law convicts us of sin and it brings condemnation and causes us to run to the grace that is Jesus. That's the purpose of the law. Where now in Jesus there is no condemnation because he met the law's standard. That's why he says, therefore is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're not condemned by the law anymore because you ran to grace. He who is grace Titus 2.11, he was manifested to all. And because now that we are in him who is grace, we're not condemned anymore. That's why we can say that. Jesus fulfilled the law, then he atoned for our sin through his own sacrifice on the cross. So he's, he's meeting both aspects here, okay? He meets the demand of God and the law and the redemption of man by his sacrifice. Okay, I wrote this down because I think it's important. He takes lost humanity, you and I, right? None good, none seeking God, our mouth full of bitterness and cussing and uh, asp and poison and all that, right? That's the lost humanity. That's you and I. And he takes the perfection of God. That's the law, all 613 plus the Ten Commandments. If you could fulfill all those, that would be the perfection of God. Jesus takes lost humanity and the perfection of God as the God-man and brings them together at the cross. And only Jesus could do that. He's grabbing a hold over here of lost humanity who needs redemption. You and I. And he's grabbing a hold of God's perfect law that he laid out that, that brings holiness if you follow it completely. And he brings them together at the cross. The cross is the most awesome display of grace that we could have. Because there in that place the law was met and I was redeemed. And it doesn't happen if it's not through Jesus Christ, all God, all man. This is so powerful as Christians, but we have to receive it. Look, when Ken and I were looking for a house, oh man, the houses you would look at, 10 acres, all wooded, you know, 2,500 square feet, whatever, way out of our price range, right? Okay, so I'm wanting to buy something at this time that was in the 100 and, I don't know, 25 or less Mark, this is 10 years ago, and, and she's looking at houses like in the 250, 300,000 mark, right? So she, you know, that's okay. I like looking at them too. Why not? Yeah, okay, yeah, uh, by faith. Uh, by faith, it has to be in my account in order for the bank to approve it, which is okay. But, 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 but so, so she's looking at all these houses and she wants to drive to every single house, and I'm okay with that at times. And then I would get excited about a house, or whatever. But just bear with me here for a minute. Think of it like this think of it. She goes and she finds this beautiful house, and we wanted to be in Green Township. In Green Township, it's 10 acres, it's, it's, it's 8 acres wooded, 2 not, right? There's a house on it, there's, there's a house that has everything that she ever wanted. It has, uh, you know, the, the pantry she wanted, the mudroom she wanted. It, it had this system in it that automatically folded and put away clothes. It not only had the vacuum you could plug into the wall, it had the, the vacuum that plugged into the wall and did itself. Dishes, as soon as you were done and you were finished, they were clean immediately. 
It's the best house ever. And it only costs like, I don't know, $500,000. That's it. I know. My budget's one twenty five, so it's only four times that, right? So let's say she comes home and she's telling me all about this house that she looked at last, you know, she just looked at. And she's all excited about it, whatever, whatever. And I just look at her and I said, I know you'd like that house. I knew that was the one for you. Here's the key to that house. I bought it last week. What do you think her response would be? Well, she'd take the key and go in there and start eating and see if the dishes was true, right? But she had to receive it. She'd have to take that key. That's you and I in the kingdom. It's right here. Jesus is saying, I've done this. You have to receive it. Try trying to gain what I've already given you. And there's some of us who come up and take it. And there's others who be like, nah, that's too good to be true. I can't do that. I'm not good enough yet. When I, when I get this taken care of in my life, then I'll come get that key. No, the house is already purchased. Jesus has already shed his blood. God has already given his grace. But you and I have to receive it. I know it's a silly example, but do you understand? That's the kingdom to you and I. What is our part? John, we're going to put some of these up here. John chapter 1, verse 12. What is our part? Because we do have a part to play. John chapter 1, verse 12. It's up there. But as many as received him, so how do you get this? To those he gave the power to become sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. John chapter 3, verse 18 says it like this. He that believes on him is not condemned. But he that believes not on him is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten son. John chapter 5 verse 24 says it like this. Truly I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me, believes on God who sent me, he's the one who has everlasting life and will not come into condemnation when he passes from death to life. Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 8 through 10. Well, I'm going to read verse 5 first. What does it say in verse 5? It says this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5 says this. Even when we were dead in our sins, there's no other worse person than that. You're dead in your sins. It means you're just full of sin. That's it. That's all you're doing all the time. He is quickening us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Verse 8. For by grace you are saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. What is our part? We must believe. You and I don't deserve Jesus. Never have. We never will. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care if you've been a Christian since the time you could utter your first word. You still don't deserve what Jesus did for you. It's a very uplifting and edifying sermon. You see what I mean? I'm building you up here. But we got to get that settled in our heads. What does it say? I want to I be that man who is standing there beating his chest and saying, God, I am a sinner above all sinners. And Jesus says, he who has sinned much is forgiven much. He had a recognition of who he was without Jesus Christ. Some of us have lost that. And because of that, we're walking through life almost in a, in a sense of, of just of, of false confidence. I'm not saying you got to walk around. No, I'm not saying walk around remembering your past and your sin. I'm not saying that at all because he doesn't remember our past sin. What I'm saying is we need to walk around acknowledged in the fear of the Lord that we are only alive today, breathing today, speaking today, living today because of the grace of God. We only came to salvation because of his grace. Because he drew us. We only have salvation because grace was given. Jesus Christ. I can only stand before God and boldly go before that throne because of what Jesus has already accomplished for me. We need to be aware of that because what does that do? It increases in our lives the fear of the Lord. When we don't have a proper fear of the Lord in our lives, we are missing out on the totality of his kingdom manifest in our lives and to those around us. And one way to not have the fear of the Lord in your life is to walk around and take grace for granted and not be aware of it. Jesus is God's grace extended to us and we will never be worthy of what Jesus or God is freely giving. We cannot scale the heights of Christendom or climb the ranks to attain it. We must receive it. One of the greatest 
times in my life where grace was extended. I've shared this story before, so I'll keep it brief. But I was at college. I was at Purdue. And I lived in an ungodly environment with ungodly men at the time. We were boys, right, in college. Now they're boys. It's 20-something years ago. Now they're just babies. But we had a party night, which wasn't unusual on a Friday. There was a fight in the stairwell. I tried to break the fight up. I've shared this before. I was wearing my best shirt because who knew what girl would come over. I was not with anybody at the time, right? My favorite shirt, I loved it so much. I was breaking up the fight. My idiot roommate's friend. I shouldn't say that. My roommate was okay. His friend was the idiot. Jumped over my shoulder and punched the guy that I just broke them up with. What a cheap thing to do. That person needs to get hit back, right? I mean, come on. Who does that? And so I'm holding me apart on the stairwell. He, he, the, the, the big guy who was below me, who was my neighbor, who I liked, and he was above me. He reaches over my shoulder and punched him from there because he's the only way to get a punch in because this guy was a bodybuilder. But anyway, and when he did that, he got blood on my shirt, my magnet to girl's shirt, right? I mean, this, this is my shirt. This is my shirt. I was so mad. I told the guy he better leave and not come back to my apartment for at least a week or I'd punch him, which he wasn't scared of because I'm, I'm the size I am now. He's like, whatever, dude. And I walked through the streets of West Lafayette, cussing every cuss word I could think of. So mad, so angry, knew I wasn't living right. I was in a horrible place. I couldn't stand the fact that my shirt's got blood on it. Couldn't stand the fact that my roommate, who I didn't really like, had friends who I liked even less. And I just made up words that weren't even cuss words. I put cuss words together just to make joint compound cuss words. And, you know, my, my father was a sailor, and, you know, I figured I was inheriting some of that, and I was just letting it go. Man, and I, I, I was not even a cusser then. I'm not a cusser now. I just... I don't think it's appropriate, and my dad would give me a small bottom if I ever cussed, right? The next morning, I had, I was walking to campus on Saturday to a library or something, and I had so much peace in my life. Some of you are like, I don't have any peace in my life. I need to go out cussing another night. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, don't. I was overwhelmed with the peace of God, his grace extended to me. And I knew in that moment I better make a different choice in my life. And I received his grace. I didn't, ex- didn't deserve his peace being extended to me. But by his grace, he extended it anyway. And I was so hungry for peace because that's what I lacked the most in college. When I was depressed, when I was angry, when I was just lost, I didn't have peace because I knew better. I was raised in the church. And by his grace, he offered the one thing he knew I needed the most, and it was peace. And all I had to do was receive it. And then walk in there, I received it. And I haven't cussed a word out of anger since. I haven't gone to a party like that since. And I don't have any more girl shirts. (laughs) I mean, I just, you know, this is my life. You can, you know, take it, learn from it. That's, what, that's the grace of God to me. I'm not worthy that grace extended the next morning, but I received it. And I thank God I received it. Because I don't know how much longer he would have kept giving it. I want to think it's forever, but you know what? I, I read to you when we were looking through the churches of Revelation, it's not forever. Because he said he gave Jezebel time to repent. She chose not to. That time was over. Right? I don't know when that time is over. God is full of mercy and grace. I believe that he goes far extending what whatever we deserve. The fact that he gave it once was more than we ever deserved. But now it also says here in the scripture that we receive his grace. Now that we receive his grace, we can do the works he created us to do. Not for salvation. Not for salvation. But because we love him. Because his life is in us now. I'm almost finished. Titus, let's go back to Titus. Let's, let's wrap it up here. This is so great. Titus chapter 2. Let's go back right there where we were. Verses 14 and 15, it says, Who gave himself for us, that's Jesus Christ, that he would redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. That word means passionate for good works. Are you passionate to do the things that God has given you to do? He's given them to us to do it. 
Some of us are so worried about the don'ts of Christianity. What if we just focus and we're passionate about the do's? You wouldn't have time to worry about the don'ts. If I spent my day constantly looking for somebody that I could bless and speak grace to and lay hands on, that they are healed, delivered, raised, I'm not going to be consumed with the don'ts of Christianity. In fact, in the two commandments that Jesus gives, he doesn't give any don'ts. Now, there are commandments Jesus gives in the New Testament of what not to do, but he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Those are do's. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's another do. If I'm consumed with those, I don't have time to worry about the don'ts. Amen? We must stop putting legalistic religious rules upon salvation. His grace is bigger than our list, our judgments, or the hoops of religion that we put upon it. There is no way to get rid of sin but him. I started out by saying we're a non-denominational church. We don't have rules for membership. We don't have a list of this, this, and this before you can do something in the church. You know, Jesus qualifies you. I don't. Does that mean that you can walk in the door? It's your first Sunday. We're going to put you back there teaching my children. Well, not my kids. <laughs> no. I want to know you. You need to know those who labor among you. I'm not saying that. But sometimes we as Christians start with our critical eye, judging. When Jesus said, believe, those who believe on me, they'll have everlasting life. Those who hear my word and they believe that God sent me, they'll, they're the ones who are saved. I don't believe in wishy-washy believing, though. When you come to Jesus, it is a life that dies how can a seed live unless it first dies? It's a life that dies. If you want to go back and you want to look in John chapter 8, it says, there were many that believed on him. This is verse 30. And then it says in the next verse, the Jews that believed on him. So it said that they believed in Jesus. And then it goes through the discourse between Jesus and the Pharisees. And by the end of the discourse, Jesus says, you're of your father the devil. He's a liar from the beginning and you're a liar. So obviously, even though it said they believed him, they didn't believe him unto salvation. You can't flippantly just say, oh, I believe in Jesus. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes, say you believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. That doesn't cut it. Or it says, well, you can't say he's Lord, but by the Spirit, Jesus is Lord. That doesn't cut it. There's no wishy-washy. If we receive Jesus Christ by grace, then grace will do what? In verse 12 of Titus, where you are right now, grace will teach you to deny worldly lust. Grace will teach you to deny ungodliness and to live soberly, which means under self-control, godly and righteous in this present world. Grace isn't licensed to do what you want. Grace is your teacher. It's Christ inside of you teaching you. You have to go against that nature in order to sin now. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, it says, By his grace I can live acceptably before him in reverence and godly fear. So these are the grace verses I want you to get a hold of as well as you move forward. Grace will teach you to deny worldly lusts. Grace will teach you to deny ungodliness and to live soberly and righteously and godly and acceptably in fear and reverence. That's the grace of God. It's not some cheap, perverted form of grace where we get to do whatever we want. Jesus didn't do whatever he wanted. He was consumed with doing what God wanted. Christ inside of us. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. We'll stop here. This is the last scripture, I promise. We already read it, so we're going to read the second half of it. It says, Of Christ, that you are in him is of God, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, holiness, that's the word sanctification, and redemption. Redemption, holiness, righteousness, and wisdom is not something I do or that Jesus does unto us. It says, he was made unto me. Jesus is my wisdom. Jesus is my holiness. Jesus is my righteousness, and Jesus is my redemption. The goal is to gradually let my life be seen at a zero level. Pastor Adam, stand with me, please. Pastor Adam spoke. We'll go ahead and stay down. If you want to find some uh, music softly you can put on, uh, Kimberly, that'd be great. Pastor Adam spoke on holiness in that last week. Whoa, sorry. Foul. Go ahead. We're going to close here. If we have a prayer team, go ahead and come up, please. I know we have one. I'm sorry. That sounded bad. <laughs> Pastor Adam spoke in holiness last week, and he gave great conviction. But where does the conviction come from for being holy? Christ inside of you. His spirit inside of you. It says right here in 1 Corinthians 1.30, Jesus was made to me holiness. I can't put a bunch of rules and regulations in my life and become holy. If I do that, I'm going back and putting myself under the law, and now I'm a debtor to the whole law. 
It says I'm making grace of no value when I do that, and I'm incurring a debt under the law again. Oh, foolish Galatians, how do you think that you can finish what you start in the spirit by the flesh? Be encouraged today. God's grace is here for you. It's Jesus Christ himself, and he is teaching you to live a life that is holy and pure and redeemed and righteous. That he is teaching you to live a life that is acceptable to God in reverence and holy fear. That he is helping you right now if you will allow him. It says Jesus Christ was tempted in all ways, yet he was without sin. So he says in your time of need, go to him who is grace and he will teach you to deny that worldly lust. He will teach you to deny that ungodliness. Does this make sense? Are we excited about grace? Grace is Jesus. We should be excited about him. He's, 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 he's God's grace extended to us. I don't want to get into the gospel of grace. There's so much more we can go here, but I need to close this. I hope I didn't overload you. I hope you have an understanding of grace now that maybe you didn't have before. And right now, I just want to, I just, I want to close in prayer. And a prayer team is up here. And after this, after I'm done speaking, you can put on a song with, with words. That'd be great. Today's the day to receive what God has freely given, Jesus Christ. Today's the day for you to get out of that sin pit and to receive the act of being made righteous, which is God's grace to you through Jesus. Romans 3, we just read it. Don't leave here today without coming up and praying with these precious saints who want to pray with you and believe with you to receive the grace of God extended to you. And let's say you're already saved. That is the best news that ever. But there's things in your life that you're struggling with. Today's today to receive grace to allow him to teach you to deny that. Come up here and have somebody agree with you. Don't be ashamed. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Shame is a tool and tactic to the enemy for you to stay where you're at. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you for your word. God, you are so great. God, that you would think so much of us made in your image that you would send Jesus Christ Grace personified, grace manifested to us. Help us today to receive all that is in Christ Jesus. The fullness of God bodily. That we are complete in him. That we are saved and justified. And that we are made righteous. That we are risen with him. That we are seated with him. That we are your workmanship, that we are your building created for good works. Help us today to receive these things by grace and to renew our minds in the truth of how you see us. Not sinners saved by grace. You don't see us as sinners. You see us as righteous. You see us as sons and daughters. Lord, maybe today is our prodigal son moment where we come to our right mind and stop trying to live as the world lives, stop trying to do things in our own natural strength, and we run back to you, Father, and receive by grace the full inheritance of what you've already freely given. In Jesus' name, amen.